Anyway, it's good to be here. I, I actually spent um, some time working in um, Stockholm. I had some teams. I used to work for um, what used to be called Fritid Zresso, um, which is now TUI, as you probably know. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what it is and why it matters. Um, this big, beautiful animal of ours. <laughs> So why it's damaging and what we can do about it. So just to kind of kick off, I want to get a little um, indication from you guys about the sort of organizations you work in. Um, and to do that, I'm going to ask how many layers there are in your organization. So if you think about from the lowest of the low, i.e. developer, all the way up to the very important people at the C-suite or the CEO, how many layers are there in your organization? Um, if you can you do that in your head? Is, do you need some paper? And no? OK, so to do that, we're just going to let's start with everyone standing up, because kind of this is the last session of the day, so you probably need to stretch your legs anyway. So let's start with everybody standing up. And then what I want you to do is, if you have only two layers in your organization, so that means either the CEO himself is the developer, <laughs> or her is the developer, or the developer reports directly into the CEO. So sit down if there's only two layers in your organization. One or two, okay. There's a couple. What about three or four? Three or four? Ah, see, we. <laughs> a few more there. Five or six? Okay. Seven? <laughs> Eight? <laughs> you lost count. <laughs> well, maybe you need a little bit of therapy afterwards. So you can come up for a. We can give them a group hug or something. Basically, yeah. So why ask this? What's the point of that? So this is not terribly scientific, but the number of layers you have in your organization is a little bit of an indicator as to how likely it is you're going to have some sort of hippo kind of decision making going on in your organization. So of course, you can even have that within the team. So it's not just you know someone who you report into, but even within the team, you can have these sorts of dynamics going on. So it's also a bit of an indication of how likely you are to be a little bit caught in the headlights, a little bit dazzled. If you don't talk to this person very often, maybe you're going to guard what you say, or you're not going to be quite as honest as you might be if you'd work with them day in, day out. So um, uh, Joshua Karievsky talked a lot about um, psychological safety within teams. People that are not necessarily in your team, and usually the CEO isn't, you may not have the same level of safety when it comes to talking with them. Um, so something to kind of be a bit aware of at least. So, you know, the first thing to do, I would say, is to make sure you understand your context. You know, whether you're a fairly flat organization, a lot more consensus driven, or whether you're in a bit more of a hippo fest, sort of, you know, buried under hippos. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Hofstede and his power distance index. Um, it Basically, the, the, you, know, you can come and read about it, but basically different countries, different cultures exhibit different ways of um, behaving um, when it comes to dealing with you know, the highest paid person's opinion. So um, the countries off to the right, so the Chinas, the Indias of the world, um, they're less likely to challenge the hippo. You're expected to basically conform to what the, you know, your, your superiors um, have decided. Whereas sort of where I'm from and you know, most Scandinavian countries are a bit more at the the low end, we expect to be able to challenge the boss and tell them when they're wrong. So it really does um, make a bit of a difference. Um, some more data, and Sweden's doing pretty well on this one. You're kind of <laughs> right down the other end here. Should the boss have all the answers? Um, and as you can see, there are some cultures where it's, it's considered that, yeah, the boss should have all the answers um, versus in other cases where we kind of expect to. So I think this is relevant to kind of have a good understanding of where you are. The other thing is, though, it's not perfect like even within um, one culture you can still have some companies that exhibit more of a um, you know issues with hippos um, and how we sort of behave within them so i want to tell a quick story here so this is um, actually um, a story f of a company in denmark there aren't too many fortune 500 companies in denmark so you can probably work out which one it is <laughs> um, about 20,000 employees um, 350 offices around the world, 117 different countries, um, and seven layers from dev or business analyst through to CEO, just to give you a bit of an idea about um, what it is. So the, the problem that this particular organization had, well, one of their biggest issues, was that 
the experience they delivered to their customers was pretty poor. They had lots of um, difficult manual processes and bureaucracy, and they pretty much made their customers um, conform to the way that they wanted to work. So it was nice and efficient for them, but a bit of a pain in the ass for the actual customers. So not a great um, way to kind of treat your organization. So the other thing is that the perception of the customers, when they went out and asked them, what sort of animal do you, um, would you describe us as? Um, and they came back and they said, well, you're a lot like an elephant. <laughs> it's a big, slow, lumbering beast. So a colleague of mine um, had worked there for many years um, on the front line dealing with customers day in, day out, and so she knew this problem back to front, and she knew that the systems were, were pretty broken. She knew that they needed to do things differently. So here's the opportunity, you know. They came up with a vision of where they wanted to be. They put together a business case. They were going to totally transform the customer experience, and they'd make it easy for customers to work with them. Customers would be delighted, of course, and they would therefore pay them more. Sounds easy, right? More revenue, more profits. It's kind of underpants gnome stuff, but um, yeah, basically this is going to be easy. So to get the, the level of, you know, to get this business case signed off and actually go down this, this um, route, they needed to get someone from the C-suite to buy into it. So then enters the senior executive. She's on the, um, uh, the, you know, the top exec level within this organization. Um, now, she's a very important person. She's got you know, thousands of people reporting into her. She's extremely busy, and she's used to getting what she wants as a general rule. Um, the thing is, this is not a, a small decision for them. This is a pretty big deal. They're gonna, we're talking massive investment. They're going to develop a new platform. Um, it's going to involve hundreds of people, millions of dollars um, to do it. It was also really risky because this organization had a pretty bad track record of um, delivery when it came to any sort of IT project. Um, to really complicate things though, the company had been going through a bit of a rough patch, had a couple of years of bad numbers, and this chief commercial officer it was, um, was under a lot of pressure to basically get those numbers up. And she saw this as an opportunity to basically do that. So she came to the, uh, you know, when she's looking at this business case, she's like, this looks great, I need you to deliver it in nine months. So immediately you're kind of like, oh, okay, nine months. So of course, um, they go away and do their, do their homework and figure out what they think they could do. And they came back with some very clear advice, which took a lot of guts for them to come back and say this. It's like, look, this is going to take at least twice as long. And not only that, but the value's a bit iffy. We're not even sure whether we're actually going to get the value out of this that we're hoping for. So yeah, it takes, takes quite a bit of guts to do that. But of course, it's Denmark, so you know, they're sort of accepted to do that. Unfortunately, she completely ignored that advice. In fact, the reaction was, maybe you're not the right person to lead this effort, which is kind of, you know, you've just been squashed, basically. That's, that's not the way to start this particular effort. <laughs> so the hippo can be a really dangerous animal in product development. This story does not have a happy ending. So they burned through $60 million in 18 months, took twice as long as they expected. But that wasn't the real problem. The real problem was that it didn't actually deliver any real value to this organization. So what they developed actually didn't deliver a lot. Huge waste of time, money, and people's talent. So maybe this is just in Denmark that they have these problems. I'm sure it never happens in Sweden, does it? <laughs> So, well, it should sound a little bit familiar because this is basically the, the modern corporate equivalent of the emperor's new clothes, you know. We treat our, our, um, our CEOs and our, that C-suite of the organization almost like corporate royalty, and when they're not wearing anything, nobody wants to tell them that. It's, it's the sort of dangerous thing to do. So let's look at a, a slightly more public example, should we say. So everyone knows who this is? He looks pretty happy there, doesn't he? Jeff Bezos, yeah, so obviously founder, CEO of Amazon. We all know him pretty well. And not only that, but, you know, to some extent, these guys are the model of how you should do things, right? Like, so this is Forbes magazine talking about how, you know, it's a culture of experimentation, how leaders at all levels are encouraged to test ideas in the marketplace, and we're going to let data, not senior leadership opinions, guide the implementation. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Except when it's not, so not even Amazon are immune to this to some extent. Has anyone here, did anyone here actually own the Amazon Fire Phone at all? No? Even seen one? No. Well, you've seen one. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yeah, so according to the inside story on this, the fire foam was a classic episode of hippo decision making, even one of our in one of our most successful innovative companies that exhibits all of the practices that you'd expect. So Bezos himself was micromanaging the development, even the smallest decisions were being made by him, and he was really excited about this feature, dynamic perspective. But no one on the team who were building it really understood why. So when someone asked the team why they're working on this feature, the answer was, because Jeff wants it. Oh, hold on, that's the wrong one. Because Jeff wants it. <laughs> yeah, you probably could say no to this guy, right? But this guy is like, like diehard five or something like that. <laughs> so not such a great one. It was pretty much a fiasco in the end. So Wall Street Journal Review was pretty scathing. It's basically gimmicks without much real world usage. So not a great example. So if you hear anyone on your team or project or initiative that you're working on say this, you might want to worry about that a little bit. Maybe think about how you're going to train the hippo because this is, this is dangerous, this kind of thinking. Another same but slightly different. Let's, um, anyone know who this is? Slightly more left field perhaps. No one knows. Ron Johnson, yeah, Ron Johnson. So this is the genius behind um, the Apple retail experience, you know, took this concept of what Apple retail is going to be like, the launch and the unbelievable success of um, Apple retail, which, um, you know, they more than double their, their closest rival in terms of sales per square foot. So, and Ron was definitely a key part of that success. And then he left. He took the CEO job at JCPenney, a um, big department store in the US, and like many senior execs, and I've seen this more times than I'd like to have seen it, is very classic CEO or senior executive thing. They go from one company where they did something that was successful, they move into the next company, and then they recreate everything that they did. Because that worked over there, it will probably work here, right? And so he basically um, attempted that same thing. It worked pretty well for him before, and he was so convinced that it was going to work that he didn't listen to his own people who said it wasn't going to work. He liked to tell employees that there were only two kinds of people, believers and skeptics, and he only wanted believers. But dangerous, right? So he even ignored expert advice from you know, other retail experts, from J. Crew and Topshop, people who basically said this wasn't going to work. But maybe he was right. Maybe it was going to work. Let's see. Uh, no. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so basically, sales down massively, Stock slumped uh, hugely as well, and the damage to the company's share price was so bad that it actually got booted out of the S&P 500, um, and ultimately um, this man lost his job. Um, but he was so convinced he was right, and he basically squashed anyone who disagreed with him. He wanted JCPenney shoppers to be something that they're not. He wanted to be them, them to be like Apple customers. So he re refused to recognize that the context was different. And eventually, his epistemic arrogance um, cost him dearly in the end of it. Uh, does anybody want to share a, a hippo story? We can change the names to protect the innocent. Anyone with a, an example? <laughs> in America, I've got, they're all climbing over each other to tell their stories. <laughs> Uh, Agile uh, 2016, last year, um, there was a lady who worked at FedEx, and at, at FedEx, they have these projects which are called Fred Says Projects. The CEO's name is Fred. And they're literally Fred, they call them Fred Says Projects. <laughs> so not terribly um, fun. So some, some pretty common examples that um, tend to crop up in our context within product development. I'm sure that would never happen here, though, in Sweden. So. Anyone seen halving of effort estimates? You know, forcing a date commitment? <laughs> oh, here's a, here are the must-have features with no explanation as to why they must-have features. Or even worse, must-haves plural, like here's the MVP, it must be this. And all too often it's the MVP is whatever the current system does plus these 10 other things that we needed to do. That's the MVP, quote unquote. Um, or one of my favorites is where a senior executive starts to get involved in design decisions, an area that is, I mean, this is classic bike shedding. They think they have an opinion about it, and so therefore they're comfortable to share it. Um, and of course, there's a hippo, so people tend to listen. 
Um, I've had an example in the UK that I observed with uh, one of the teams from Government Digital Service sort of showing this new, I new UI they're about to roll out for students when they're making student loan applications. And the minister, the government minister, was like, well, it really the copy needs to say this, and I need that button moved over there. And we were like, but we tested that, and it confused everyone, and that doesn't work. I mean, in this case, luckily, we had the data to basically back it up, to basically tell the hippo to move on. But it's pretty hard to say no to a government minister, usually. So I think we all agree this is a problem. Yes? No? I mean, not in Sweden, of course, but it is a problem. <laughs> so what can we do about it? So five tactics that you can tell your friends in other countries about that they might want to have a go with. So the first of which is, and this is a favorite of mine, make the problem visible. Like all too often, your senior executives are so far away from the work that they don't actually understand what's going down on down within the actual, they're not at the coal face, so they can't see it. So they are doing what the drunk looking for his keys is doing. They're looking under the street light because that's where the light is, not where he dropped them. So we need to do the same thing for our senior executives, our hippos, and basically make the problem visible. Because we may see something, whether it be a customer problem or some issue relating to the flow, and we need basically need to make that a bit more visible to them. So here's some examples, a couple of favorites of mine. Um, almost the first thing I do when I come into an organization is I build this histogram. So let me have a look at all your systems, I'll start collecting some data, and I'll produce this histogram, which shows them how fast they are end-to-end. -end. Of course, garbage in, garbage out, but if they don't have it already, it's better than nothing. And this gives them some visibility of a very key problem for them, which is how long things are taking inside their organization. So if you've got you know, a median of 150 days end-to-end, -end, or for a key system that's over a year long to get a change out of it, on average, then maybe you want to do something about that. But if they don't have this data, they'll probably bleat about other things like predictability, or, oh, those estimates are always wrong, or why can't we just get more efficiency in this system? You know? Whereas if we look, start looking at the end-to-end -end time frames, you get them focusing on the right things. Um, another favorite of mine, again, this is almost the second thing I'll do, is take a snapshot at the portfolio level. I see a lot of this being done within teams, but very rarely do I see it being done across teams, across the whole portfolio. So you need some visualization of all of the work that's going on inside the whole system in order to get an idea of what, you know, where things are. Because there's no good having boards which show the flow of these 326 things and kind of ignoring the 3,000 things that are kind of queuing up off the page. That's not on our board, that's you know, before it gets to approval or whatever it happens to be. So uh, yeah, this is not abnormal to find an order of magnitude of things being worked on, analyzed, you know, prioritized before they get to teams, um, at least in my experience. And another favorite of mine, typically I'd do some samples of this rather than do it for everything, but some sampling of this can be quite, um, just, let's just look at the last release that went in. Let's take a sample of seven features, and we'll run some value stream maps to show the waiting time in the system. And when you map it out, it's kind of interesting how much waiting there is. But again, if senior executives and hippos don't have this information, they'll focus on the information that they do have, which is usually how much it costs or you know that delivery date was missed. If you start showing them the amount of waiting time in the system, you can actually go and do something about it. So, first tactic for how to train your hippo, make the problem visible. You may assume that they know it, nine times out of 10 they won't. So you need to put that actually in front of them. So move the street light to where the actual problem is, where you dropped the keys, you know, rather than <laughs> looking for the keys because that's where the light is. A uh, second tactic, one which I will admit that I'm not very good at, but I'm working on. So Edgar Schein talks about the art of um, the art of asking instead of telling. I have a tendency to tell rather than <laughs> ask. <laughs> um, but it can be quite powerful, this, as a, as a mechanism for basically lowering the defenses of people within the system. So you're basically trying to frame the conversation as you asking for help. You're not trying to tell them something, you're asking them to help you understand it. It could be about the market, it could be about you know, some the risks of this initiative, it could be about the potential value, whatever it happens to be. Um, it could be the organization's previous history. You've just been here for longer than me, you know. Um, so the reason this works is because you're lowering their defenses. 
You're temporarily lowering their defenses, and you're making yourself vulnerable in doing that, which makes them less likely to attack you because you've lowered your defenses. And then if they don't take advantage of you, then your trust in them also goes up. So you're basically creating trust in the system. Again, something that um, Karievsky talked about uh, yesterday, I think it was. I'm forgetting which day is which. Um, it's also about kind of sidestepping your ego as well as the ego of the hippo. So if you go head to head with them, you're much more likely to get a negative result. Um, so, you know, I get a lot of senior executives are kind of like, yeah, so we think we've got this problem. We're thinking of rolling out safe. It's going to be amazing. I'm like, uh, <laughs> maybe you could try that. You could do that. But, you know, maybe let's understand what problem it is that you're actually trying to solve first rather than just double click install this methodology that you think is going to solve which problem. I don't know. Um, so you, we end up, you know, using words that basically um, respectfully emphasize their experience and their knowledge. You know, I'm a bit lost on something. You're the expert on this. Given your experience, can you help me to understand this? You know, there's something I'm not quite getting here. So your language is much more softer and you're basically inviting them into that. So again, what this is doing is it's opening the door to building trusting relationships. So until they know that you actually, that you aren't trying to undermine them, which is obvious, uh, is often their initial assumption, or you're just trying to undermine me. Um, unless they know that you're not trying to undermine them, they probably won't even hear you. They'll start off on the defensive. So that's tactic two, something I'm still working on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Virginia Satir has a kind of like rule of three as a mechanism. So as she says, one choice is no choice, two choices is a dilemma, that's all that. Three choices offers new possibilities. So a um, couple of ways to do this. Like you, can, you can consider at least three different ways of going forward. So don't prematurely converge on a solution. Um, start off by going broader. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the double diamond of the design thinking sort of background, but basically you're going broader, you're collecting more potential options before you then converge. Um, and the typical place to do this would be, you know, rather than just deciding on what the MVP should be up front, maybe you could look at three or four different ways of slicing an MVP based on what it is that you're trying to do. You know, you can do this at sort of story level, like lots of different splitting patterns, lots of different patterns for splitting stories, which works pretty well within the story level. Again, don't just choose one, look at at least three or four of them and then decide maybe after you've done three or four, okay, this is, might be the best way to split this particular thing. But you can also do it at the higher level, at the idea, or initiative, or MVP sort of level. Maybe we could slice this according to who, or maybe we'll slice it according to what, or maybe it's the why that we need to slice as, as an initial MVP. So you're basically trying to come up with three or four different options for how you could actually slice this thing up and uh, start to approach it. Make sense? Yeah. And then there's the, the opposite side of this, which is sort of Jerry Weinberg talks about, which is you know, if you can't think of three things that might go wrong with your plans, then there's something wrong with your thinking. So it's not just about deciding a way forward that you need to go wide before you converge. It's also considering the different ways that this thing could go badly. So again, you're, that's giving you permission as a team, as an organization, to be a bit more open about the way these, the wheels could fall off this um, particular thing. So that's the third tactic, rule of three. So allow that divergence to happen before you converge on one option or decide on a solution. Um, another tactic, which I, um, feels a little bit weird the first few times you do it, but um, once you get into the rhythm of it, it's a lot easier. Anyone familiar with parallel um, thinking methods like De Bono's Six Hats? Yeah? I definitely recommend looking, looking it up. For those of you who don't um, have any experience of this, so this is traditionally how we discuss stuff. It becomes a debate, you know. So this is the adversarial confrontation that we get from ancient Greece. We get someone talking about why it will work, and that person's arguing with someone who's saying why it won't work, and they just go hammer and tongs at each other, and hopefully one of them comes out alive. Um, or another version would be, well, I'm going to talk about the information and data we have about this particular thing, and then someone comes at it with their feelings and their intuition. I have three sisters, so I kind of... I have that bottom one quite a lot. I'm talking about you know, the data and the information we have about it, and they're talking about how they feel about it. It's like we're basically talking past one another, in effect. So the other problem we have is that 
when we're listening, we're actually not really listening. We're mostly thinking about what our argument is, and we're trying to form you know, a smarter argument to catch someone out. So we're not really listening to what they're saying. So I think that's the other problem we have with this traditional version of it. And it's designed to win the argument, in effect. So it is adversarial in nature. Whereas parallel thinking as an alternative, you're going through all of those things the same as you would before, but you're doing it together. So let's all together think about what information and data we have about this particular proposal. And then let's all together put on our yellow hat and we'll think about why this might work. What are the different reasons as to why this might work? And then once we're done with that, we can move on to, okay, why might this not work? And we're all thinking in the same direction. It's not fighting one another, it's thinking in the same direction, in effect. And then what are our feelings and intuition about this? So you're, this is a more collaborative exploration of different perspectives on the problem. A great way of controlling when you've got a hippo in the room because you're providing room and permission to think in different ways, not just the way that the hippo has sort of... Um, yeah, or otherwise, you get these sort of conversations where you start discussing something and then the, the hippo pipes up and says, oh, well, I think we should do it like this. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, vroomp. You know, the oxygen sucked out of the room. All of a sudden, the discussion's over because you know, let's just... It's easy just to go along with that, you know, rather than challenge them up front. I'm pretty sure you've all had some sort of experience of Norm Kurth's four questions as a retrospective model, I'm guessing. This is basically a classic example of parallel thinking if you're doing them, um, you know, one after the other together. So you're basically focusing in, in parallel uh, on these different questions. Um, another example from um, Dave Snowden and Cognitive Edge is the ritual descent which if you're a really brave organization and this is a safe thing to do, this can be a really good way of basically testing your ideas and making them better as, as a mechanism. You, know, you basically have one person here who basically explains what it is that they're proposing, what their idea is, and then you have these three people. She turns around and then these three people basically rip it to shreds. Um, so ritual descent. It does take a little bit of a, it definitely requires a, a psychologically safe setup. Um, you wouldn't want to do this in an organization where trust is relatively low, um, I would suggest. So different mechanisms, success for you know, retrospectives, ritual descent, what you're doing here is you're providing time and permission for these alternative views to be shared. Yeah, and as a mechanism for basically, it's not parking the, the hippo or getting them rid of them in the room because their experience and skills and all those sorts of things uh, are still valuable, but they become one voice in the room pointing in different directions rather than, you know, we all converge on that particular person's um, viewpoint early on. And then the fifth one. Anybody read this book, Thinking Fast and Slow? Okay. It's a wonderful, um, it's a hard read for some of it, but it's definitely worth. So for those of you who haven't read it, it's um, uh, Kahneman and Tversky basically looked at the way these different modes of thinking that we have. System one is our fast, intuitive, gut feel thinking kind of um, approach, which is great in lots of situations where we have had lots of data to train our gut feeling and our intuition. System two is our slower, more analytical, it's more logical, it's more rational, and it's our informed thinking. But it is a bit slower. Um, it takes a bit more effort to go into that space. So the analytical thing makes it sound like it's deterministic and all about arriving at the right answer. But that's not actually it. It's about being less wrong. So a little bit of analysis can actually help you to make better decisions or just be less wrong is the... Is the um, the instance. Don Reinertsen tells a, a, a joke about two guys who come across a, um, a bear in the woods um, and ov obviously you want to run away from that. <laughs> and one of them stops to do up his shoelace and the other guy's like, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And he's like, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. So the, the point being is that, you know, we're not trying, we're not aiming for perfection here, we're aiming for better than what we're currently using. Um, and that's actually not an easy, it's pretty easy to outrun that guy. <laughs> So one area where our gut feel um, doesn't serve us very well, in my experience, is the assumptions that we make about value and urgency. Um, I, I talked um, a little earlier about cost of delay, and this is a particular area where we do not have very good experience. We do not have the patterns that we need in order to make good gut feel intuitive decisions. Um, and this is a 
classic story. So here's a hippo um, here, Al. He's a good guy, lots of experience in the business. And what they're doing here is they're doing a table spread of all the things that are already prioritized, they're already going to be done in the next release. Um, and we ask them, so which one of these has the highest um, cost of delay? And he's, of course, pretty sure. And he grabs one. He's like, oh, that's easy. That's this one. And he sticks it at the top of the table. And nobody questions it, of course, because it's the hippo. You can't be doing that. And then over the next two weeks, an hour a week, we go through a process of basically putting a price tag on time. We give them an economic model um, for value and um, a way for kind of inputting the urgency. So here's the, the value framing that we ga gave them in order to try and figure out what the value of these things are. Um, and we went through this kind of process of figuring out why, why, why we would do these things. And after doing this, we actually got to the point where what, his, what he thought initially was the number one turned into number nine two hours later, over two weeks, but um, two hours worth of input later, it became number nine. The difference here is that they'd actually engaged system two, they'd been a bit more analytical, and they were sharing their assumptions. These assumptions were being made anyway. Again, we're outrunning the other guy, we're not outrunning the bear. So it's not that we're looking for perfect decisions. I'm looking for them to surface their assumptions and share them. And it's really unfair of us to expect one person, Al in this case, or the hippo in all of our cases, to have all of the information that they need in order to make a good decision. Usually that information is distributed in the organization. So many brains, especially many experienced subject matter expert brains, comes up with a much better result with a little bit of analysis than relying on the gut feel of one person. Um, typically, when we do this, when I do this for the same project, so I'll put the same team who are all working on the same initiative and I'll ask them to estimate what the cost of delay is, um, I'll get a 50 to 1 spread within the same team. And these people are all making decisions day in, day out, uh, making trade-off decisions, and there's a massive spread between um, you know, what the highest person and what the lowest person would say. And they're all making decisions about this particular initiative, so not very good gut feel, basically. The other thing is that uh, our, uh, this is, I found this quite um, unintuitive, but basically the top quartile of the things in our backlogs are three orders of magnitude more valuable than the bottom quartile. And even worse than that, it's basically a power walk, as I talked about a couple of hours ago. So the first time I saw it, this was surprising, but now I have a gut feel for it. I expect this now. I know that there's going to be some features, a very small number of features, that will end up being three or four orders of magnitude more than the rest. So I'm used to it, basically. The, the basic <laughs> story behind this is <laughs> don't trust your gut on this because you just don't have the patterns. Not yet. You know, once you get more used to it and you develop the patterns from doing some analysis and you get the experience of it, then your gut feel gets a lot better. But initially, it tends to be pretty crap as a general rule. So that's the fifth tactic that I'd recommend. You know, it does make sense in some cases. Now, not all hippos are convinced by data. I've had lots of examples where you can put some pretty convincing data in front of the hippo and they'll still ignore it. <laughs> but sometimes it's worth trying. And you, know, you can mix and match these sorts of things. So that's five, um, five tactics that I would recommend for, for training your hippo. So one last thing, and it, it's a bit of a warning actually. Um, if you look around you, if you're not already in a position of leadership, you're probably on that sort of trajectory. So whilst it's nice and funny to talk about the hippo and the bad things that they do, the sad thing is, is that you need to think about how you're going to be when you get into that situation. So I've worked with you know, a bunch of senior executives who don't realize the impact they're having. So a classic story of um, you know, a senior executive of um, an organization walking past the desk of, de of a developer, sees the feature that they're working on, and says, like, oh, that looks really cool. I mean, it's kind of prototype stage, but that looks really cool. When do you think we can get that by? You know, throw away comment. When do you think we can get that by? Deer in the headlights, you know, sort of uh, October. Uh, and she oh, cool, great. And then she walks off and to lots of busy meetings because she's busy, right? What she doesn't realize is that little conversation turns into a commitment through a series of Chinese whispers throughout the organization that has become a very serious commitment where people are dropping other work, transferring things over here, doing this. A whole bunch of decisions came from this throwaway 
um, comment that they made. So you've got to be a bit more aware about how people might interpret what you say, and you have to be active when you become, you know, when you grow up and become the boss. <laughs> you need to be a bit more cognizant about how people are going to perceive what it is that you're saying. So cute and harmless today, you're all very cute and harmless, <laughs> but potentially a big problem tomorrow. So just something to be aware. And in our context, there are so many cognitive bias that basically lead us off into wrong directions. They're great for keeping us alive when we're you know, hunter-gatherers, but they're not terribly good in product development. So all of our rules of thumb that we use to help us survive actually lead us into trouble in our context. So it's, it makes sense to kind of be aware of it, especially as you find yourself in a leadership position and all of a sudden people are kind of paying more respect to, your to the, the things that you say simply because of your position in the organization. Yeah. So remember very well what it's like to have to deal with those, those hippos. Um, be aware of your limitations, in effect. Don't believe you're in BS. Don't be a hypocrite. So, thank you. <laughs>